you all to this session that we've entitled Breaking Down the Double Helix, Crime Laboratories and the Courts. And I'm delighted to have three speakers who I think are going to give you, I know are going to give you a great deal of information, important information about technology, the crime laboratory, the courts, and some of the other experiences. I'm gonna briefly introduce each of our speakers so that we can then go right into the talks. Our first speaker today, who's seated in the middle, is Dean Gialamas. Dean is the director of the Orange County Sheriff Coroner's Crime Laboratory. He's also president of the American Society of Crime Laboratory Directors. I think Dean's a busy guy. Dean's also intimately familiar with issues regarding post-conviction DNA and its impact on crime laboratories, so Dean's gonna present I know some very important information in that regard. Following Dean is going to be Mitch Morrissey at the end. Mitch is the elected district attorney in Denver, Colorado. Mitch is a career prosecutor who was the first prosecutor to introduce DNA testing evidence in a trial in Denver itself and is very active in both in cold case investigations and the use of familial DNA searches. And he's going to talk about the use of databases with post-conviction DNA testing. And then our last speaker is Betty Lane Desports. Betty Lane is a criminal defense attorney in Richmond, Virginia, who also serves on the board of directors of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. She is a leader, not only in Virginia, but also nationally in having states recognize the right of indigent defendants to expert forensic assistance. Betty Lane is gonna tell us a number of lessons learned from the state of Virginia in this particular field as well. So that's our lineup, and Dean, you're gonna lead us right off. Well, thank you very much, Woody. Um, I get the uh, distinct honor of trying to keep all of you entertained and awake after that uh, full lunch, and I also have, I guess, the distinction of being the first science guy up in the program. Uh, First of all, I want to thank uh, NIJ and the Symposium Planning Committee for uh, inviting me to speak today. Um, I, it's truly an honor to be here, and I, I thank you for that. Uh, just by way of introduction, I'm not going to go into a lot of details about DNA. Um, this talk is going to be focusing more on the crime laboratory issues and not so much on DNA itself. All of you have a wonderful CD that was handed out to you as part of the package, and for those of you that haven't seen it, uh, it's an amazing program that was put together with the President's DNA Initiative funding and, and support work from NIJ and NFSTC, and I'd encourage you to use that tool uh, as a means to learn more about DNA and how it applies to your work. When it comes to DNA and post-conviction, um, there really is no single forensic discipline that has created as much change as DNA has uh, toward post-conviction cases. Um, the technology advancement that we've had has brought both a sense of um, excitement and uh, disappointment at the same time within the criminal justice community. So how does that apply to our post-conviction work? Um, I'll, I'm not going to go into detail in all these areas, but obviously from a crime lab perspective, the first and most important thing is case identification and evaluation. Uh, there's a whole topic on this, and so I'll only touch on this very briefly. Uh, there's also the issue of locating and preserving evidence. Again, a whole other topic following our discussion uh, to talk about it, but I'll talk a little bit about some of the case record review issues as they pertain uh, to crime lab concerns. Uh, more importantly, I'll talk about the remaining, and that's about the laboratory testing, uh, the type of evidence selection, the technology being used, uh, the laboratory selection process, uh, database technology I'll touch on briefly, but I know Mitch will be talking a little bit more about that, and then finally the reporting and notification aspects. So locating and preserving evidence, what are some of the things that you need to understand or know from a crime lab perspective? Um, you're all aware of the uh, efforts that need to go into finding and locating, reviewing chain of custody documentation, but you need to also uh, make sure you remember to look in all the areas outside of just the crime laboratory. This can include um, uh, evidence that may be in courts, police property rooms, uh, hospitals, medical examiner's offices, even private labs during the course of testing uh, pre-trial. Uh, locating and reviewing the laboratory case file, uh, including a review of all the laboratory reports and notes. Uh, there may be previously prepared sample splits um, that were done in that case and sent to a private laboratory. There may be sample extracts that are remaining. Some laboratories choose to track that as evidence. Other laboratories do not. So you may want to look into where additional evidence may be uh, remaining. 
Um, you may also to determine if other laboratories um, also have some of that same evidence remaining as well. You may have to consider the need for reference samples. Um, you may need to obtain secondary reference samples. A secondary reference sample would be a sample obtained from a non-traditional source from the standpoint of, let's say, a toothbrush or a hair comb, uh, something that would be in constant contact with an individual outside of a known sample, uh, depending on how old the case is or what the circumstances are and the evidence that remains. And ideally, as you'll all hear uh, through many speakers, I'm sure, the communication and collaboration with a local crime lab uh, may be key in locating the evidence that you're uh, trying to find. So laboratory testing, what are some of the considerations that need to take place? Uh, first and foremost, and one of the uh, uh, individuals who came up discussed this uh, with a question, and that is, uh, I think the thing you need to determine first and foremost is, what is the question you're trying to answer? And is there something probative about that question, or is there something probative about that answer that's going to provide you with critical information? We don't want to be in the business of just testing things just because we have new technology. It needs to answer a probative question because in my mind as a scientist, are we spending time sampling an item now at the risk of perhaps not being able to conduct an analysis down the road? So there needs to be some careful consideration of the current state of technology and whether it can answer that question. And it may not be limited to the items that have been previously examined. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, there may be uh, cases in which evidence had not been examined. There may be evidence that exists in other areas that was not considered uh, during that original investigative component. Um, you may also have to consider biological samples that were previously tested. However, uh, no DNA recovery was possible. With new technology and new methodology, we may be able to get more information out of samples that have uh, less and less quantity of DNA. And so sometimes applying new DNA technology or new advances in science can actually gain us more information. As was spoken about earlier too, just a reminder that DNA is not a be-all uh, technology. It's not going to answer every question and it's not designed to. It's a tool and a large toolbox. And that's how I look at forensic science. Forensic science is a, is a wonderful repository of a collection of solutions and tools that can be used. DNA is one of them, uh, but it's not the only one. And it, sometimes there are cases in which DNA isn't going to answer the question. It's going to take other types of physical evidence to be able to evaluate and determine. And so don't limit yourself to DNA, but I, I'm, I'm aware and being respectful of the fact that we're focusing on DNA for the symposium, but just a reminder to keep that in mind. And finally, um, don't hesitate to use your experts. Uh, you've got experts in local crime labs. Uh, from the prosecution standpoint, from the defense standpoint, you have obviously uh, experts that can be privately retained. Um, oftentimes enlisting their help and involving scientists in the process of review is going to lead to a better review of the cases that you have that may be coming your way. Without the use of a scientist, you may be missing out on opportunities or issues that need to be addressed, and I highly encourage you to use the expertise that you have available to you. I think one of the next questions you'll come to from a laboratory perspective is technology selection. What are you going to choose as a means of technology for moving forward? Um, this is particularly important, especially if you're going to be considering inconclusive results from previous cases. Um, again, the technology that you use is going to have to answer a probative question, and there are many of them out there. Nuclear STRs, mitochondrial DNA, YSTRs, even now uh, looking at mini STRs. Uh, but you have to ask yourself, what are you trying to solve and how can I be able to answer that question? Uh, many of some of these newer technologies like YSTRs and mitochondrial, uh, no database application. You're not going to be able to run it against a database. So you have to be certain that that's the direction you want to pursue. Um, those are all questions to consider and factor in. As mentioned earlier as well, but you need to consider touch or trace DNA types of samples. Um, some laboratories in the United States uh, are approaching near low copy number type of abilities in their work. And what work that was previously done may not have recovered enough DNA or was not enough to be able to provide a full profile, but perhaps going back and looking at touch or trace DNA samples, contact samples, may be something that can be pursued today. There are a, a handful of labs in the country that are able to do this, and those are um, new areas that can be considered as well. And also consideration for non-traditional DNA samples. Um, I'll show you some examples in a moment, but um, oftentimes uh, we relegate ourselves to thinking about biological samples or samples that have tr uh, obvious biological stains to them, and there may be more samples that you can look at and test. 
we're all very much used to the traditional samples, blood, semen, saliva being the most common that we test, but other things such as uh, uh, hair or urine, bone, teeth, tissue, those kinds of things come to play. But what about some of the other unconventional things? Um, you know, are those, are those relative to your case that can answer some questions? Drink containers, food or candy wrappers, um, toothpicks, straws, gloves, cables, cords, hats, clothing, cigarette butts, uh, contacts with uh, doors, windows, or other points of entry or egress, um, handled tools and weapons, zip ties, and then my personal favorite, rocks. Um, we had a case where uh, rocks were used, uh, thrown into a window um, to a school district in which uh, a number of, in fact, all of the school district computers were, were uh, stolen, a lot of personal information. Uh, the rocks that were picked up by uh, the assailants at the time were recovered. We sampled them and we found DNA and actually got a hit off of it. So again, think outside the box if necessary for these touch trace types of samples. Continuing on with the laboratory testing considerations, you may need to consider which laboratory you're going to choose. And uh, this, is, this is a big leap now, because this is the point now where evidence exists, you found it, there's an agreement for testing, and I realize that that could be quite a process in itself. But assuming you've reached that point now, the next consideration that comes into mind is where are you going to go to get this tested? Um, you may choose a local resource, you may choose the investigating agency, you may be looking at a private uh, laboratory. There may have to be some agreement that is reached uh, between the litigants in the case to determine uh, whether or not there's a laboratory that can be agreed upon to send the samples. Uh, you may have to consider things like the laboratory's experience. Are they accredited? Uh, whether that accreditation uh, type uh, makes a difference, whether it's legacy accreditation or moving toward ISO accreditation. The types of technology that that laboratory has available. Uh, the location may be an issue. Is it located within your state? Do you have to go out of state? Following up to that are the cost implications especially if you're having to pay for the analysis. Are you going to have to fly individuals in for uh, testimony at some later point in time? How is that cost going to be covered? Who bears that cost? Uh, if that can't be borne by either of the uh, individuals or um, persons bringing that forward, are there federally funded assistance programs that can be used? And they exist today. Uh, there may be resource implications. For example, in local labs, uh, Barry Fisher was uh, always uh, singing the tune of forensic science and, and clearly the issues that many labs have are significant backlogs. And with those significant backlogs, is this something that your local lab can handle? Can they take on this additional burden, uh, if you will, of being able to process this kind of case? Can they meet the timeline that you need, even if they can accept uh, the case that is being submitted? Those are all questions that have to be addressed. Uh, depending on the samples, there may be issues of sample consumption and or sample witnessing. Um, if it's going to be witnessed, by whom will it be witnessed? And if so, how is that going to be coordinated with the laboratory? Again, all considerations and things like cost, location, and the laboratory you choose. And then when it comes to sample consumption, the questions that come to mind would be things like, who makes the call? Um, some of these samples will have to be consumed in order uh, for that test to be um, completed. And so that, that is something that has to be determined. Is that a joint decision? Is that a decision by the laboratory? Are you going to give the laboratory the discretion of determining whether the sample needs to be consumed or does that need to be reported back? Again, all considerations that have to take place in the laboratory analysis. There has to be a consideration of whether those samples um, can or should be uploaded. There are legal considerations as to whether those samples may be uploaded. And if they can be, then the next question is should, be, should they be? Um, consideration for new ENDIS rules that are going to be coming out um, in July. Uh, those of you sending samples to private laboratories, you have to have a sponsoring laboratory approve of that private laboratory's work before you submit a sample. Otherwise, that sample is ineligible for CODIS, regardless of whether you've complied with a legal requirement or not. That changes everybody's world. You have to pre-plan about who's going to do that upload and who's going to sponsor that sample. Should those samples be run against any other types of databases, any local, regional, or other types of, um, I'll say, privately maintained or uh, more properly termed outside of CODIS uh, databases? Consideration of the limitations of the database itself. It's dependent on the qualifying samples that are in there. We all know across the country there are various different laws that exist about mandates about who goes into the database, and that is a consideration that you have to take into place. Uh, ranging from California with probably one of the more uh, aggressive types of uh, sample collections that changed to an all, all felon arrestee this year in January to other states that are um, not as comprehensive. 
and then recognition that older technology is not available for database comparison. So anything that has been done with RFLP or DQ Alpha uh, or newer technology like WISE or mitochondrial, those systems are currently not available for a database search. So when you choose that application or you choose that technology, there is no ability to search a nationwide, statewide, or local database in those areas. Finally, the reporting issues. Um, once the laboratory work is done, the reports uh, results need to be reported. And that laboratory distribution may have to follow a protocol based on local or laboratory uh, requirements or guidelines. There may be agreements that, that are set up between the parties who are asking for the testing to be done. Who will receive the reports, who's notified, and when may be considerations that have uh, come into place. And these are all things that are uh, protocol driven, they're policy driven, uh, but would have to be considered in each case as to when those results are shared, with whom, and when. So finally, my thoughts from a laboratory consideration, and this is not new news, it's not earth shattering, but these are the, the common themes that uh, will lead to a more effective or successful post-conviction testing process that exist. Um, we have a lot of tools are, that are available, but some of the keys, in my opinion, are the excellent coordination and communication amongst those involved, and that has to include the prosecutor, uh, the defense community, and the crime laboratory. How well defined and articulated are procedures or protocols? Um, that exist for handling those post-conviction cases. Ideally, those, some of those questions, some of those issues need to be sorted out well before you're dealing with those cases. And then a knowledgeable understanding of forensic science and that technology that exists that can be applied. Uh, you want to make sure that if you've got limited evidence, you're doing the best you can with that using the technology that's available today. I'm going to leave you and close with uh, a quote from Paul Kirk. And what's amazing about Paul Kirk is uh, he's kind of uh, termed the uh, grandfather of uh, criminalistics and forensic science in the United States. He started the first uh, PhD criminalistics program in the U.S. at UC Berkeley. And although these thoughts are uh, from the 1950s and later penned in the 1970s, they're just as applicable today as they were when he, when he penned them. And it's really the challenge to forensic science, and, and finally, at the last statement, as I'll read it, is the challenge to the criminal justice community. Wherever he steps, whatever he touches, whatever he leaves, even unconsciously, will serve as a silent witness against him. Not only his fingerprints, but his hair, the fibers from his clothing, the glass he breaks, the tool mark he leaves, the paint he scratches, the blood or semen he deposits or collects. All of these and more bear witness against him. This is evidence that does not forget. Only physical evidence is infallible, and only then when it is properly recognized, studied, and interpreted. Thank you. All right, thanks very much, Dean. We'll take our questions at the end. So next up is gonna be Mitch Morrissey from Denver. Thanks, Woody. Certainly an honor for me to be here today, and uh, it was interesting when I got here yesterday to realize that uh, it was warmer in Denver, Colorado when I left than it was here, uh, but that's okay. Uh, I was asked to talk about DNA databasing, and I could not imagine a more boring subject to try to uh, address you about, so I thought I might talk about f familial DNA search investigations, which include uh, a search of your database to look for relatives uh, in the database. Many of you know what familial DNA searching is, but uh, in Denver we have been doing research to, to try to determine if we can use our database and use our state database to look for relatives of people that may be wrongfully convicted or may be people that we're interested in catching for committing violent offenses. And so basically what we're doing is scouring our database to look for uh, potential siblings or parents that may be in the database of people that left evidence in our cases that aren't in the database. And one thing I, unfortunately, as an elected official, get to talk to a lot of legislators, and 
sometimes that's a very unpleasant task. Um, but I always try to remind them when we're talking about DNA and we're talking about funding for DNA and the kind of uses that we do, is that 90% of the victims of the crimes we solve with DNA, the victims are women, and they're women of violent offenses. The 10% that are left, the majority are kids. In my jurisdiction, when somebody gets, commit, gets convicted of one of these offenses, they face a life sentence. If it's a homicide, life without parole. If it's a sex assault, it's an indeterminate sentence to life. So when we're talking about these crimes, there's no question these are the most violent crimes, usually the type of predators that somebody in my position is interested in catching. But also, if somebody's wrongfully convicted of this kind of offense, they're going to be spending an awful lot of time in the Colorado Department of Corrections. And I believe that we can use familial searching to solve cold cases, uh, cases that are not cold, but any kind of cases, and also to exonerate innocent people. I was lucky enough to be able to go to the UK and see a lot of the forensics that they do there. And quite frankly, they are very efficient with their money, and they do an awful lot of real good work. I primarily was interested in their familial search packages that they put together. Uh, they have put together 157 uh, specific packages on cases that they've been trying to solve. They limit those cases to cold cases, serial offenders. They have very strict guidelines how and when they use their database in this way. And they've had uh, a number of successes when it comes to doing this kind of work. And I just, I, you know, I could go through the stories of each of these individuals, but I don't have the time, and uh, they're all pretty much the same. These are murderers and rapists that uh, have been captured through familial searching in the UK. Six murders, 25 rapes, two child abandonments. The only woman, Miss Bond down there in the corner, she's the one that abandoned two of her children, uh, gave birth to two different babies two years apart, abandoned them on the street corner, and they were able to do a familial search of where they found her brother in the database and tie back to Ms. Bond, who uh, hopefully is no longer abandoning kids. One of their more famous familial searches all actually came out of a trial that they had. Uh, it was a brutal murder in 1988 of Ms. White. Ms. White, uh, three men were tried for uh, killing her in 1990. They spent four years in prison, and they were eventually exonerated. Primarily, uh, the Court of Appeals there found that the police had overreached in dealing with one particular of the three men, and uh, they threw the conviction out. They were never retried. But I think that many of you that deal with exonerations understand. Now, this is the longest trial in the history of the UK up to that time, that when it gets the kind of media and uh, gets the kind of attention that these three men got, that there's still a large majority of your society, your state, your city, that believes the individuals that got exonerated are, in fact, the individuals that committed the offense. Uh, the Brits did not let this case go. They did a familial search on it. Fifteen years later, they were able to tie the real rapist, Mr. Gaffour, uh, through his 14-year-old nephew, uh, to the crime, and when they contacted him, they matched the DNA, uh, he gave them a full confession. And uh, there were apologies that were sent to the three men that were wrongfully convicted. This is a case that's currently pending in Milwaukee, and I've talked to Norm Gann about it, and I came across it. It's an individual by the name of Mr. Ott, who in 1995 got convicted of murdering a 16-year-old runaway. Uh, she, there was an eyewitness to Mr. Ott cutting her throat. Uh, he has since recanted. Uh, the other witness, who was the driver, drove them up to the place where the girl was killed. He himself was murdered a few years later. Uh, but there was DNA testing done in 2007. The Milwaukee DA's office agreed to let Mr. Ott out of prison. It's my understanding that they are looking into, over the next six months, if they have retesting or evidence that they may bring him back to trial and try him again. I suggested to Norm Gant that they should run a familial search on this case. It may very well exonerate Mr. Ott. It may very well give them a relative that they then can find somebody that's responsible for murdering three people in their community. 
I really think it is a perfect case for familial searching, both in exonerating somebody, potentially, and also in uh, finding, finding the serial murderer, at least for the two others, if Mr. Ott is responsible for this homicide. And then many of you are probably aware of uh, the Daryl Hunt situation, and I have a clip from 60 Minutes on that. Agree, and not just for its potential to catch criminals, but for its power to set innocent people free. 23 years ago, Winston-Salem was shaken by a brutal killing. A young newspaper editor named Deborah Sykes was dragged to this grassy area, raped and stabbed 16 times. Although there was little to go on, Daryl Hunt was charged with first-degree murder. Did they have a fingerprint? No. Did they have any blood? No. Did they have any semen? They had semen, but it didn't match me. It didn't match his no. blood type. And yet, Hunt was convicted and sentenced to life. Ten years later, when DNA testing came along, it showed he was not the rapist. But to Hunt's astonishment, the judge said he still could have committed the murder and sent him right back to prison. He spent another nine years behind bars before the state ran the DNA from the crime scene through North Carolina's database. And that's when things got interesting. They got what seemed to be a hit to a convicted felon named Anthony Brown, but the sample was so old, it was degraded, and the result inconclusive. So they flew the sample to Angelo Delamana's state-of-the-art lab in Alabama, which produced a clear profile that revealed that Anthony Brown was not the rapist. You see, uh, the, mm -hmm. the, the donor of the semen was a 1920, but he's a 1723. Right, so that one alone? That one by itself. He's out. Right. But the two profiles were remarkably close. Of the 26 alleles that are in the crime scene sample, this individual shares 20. What do you say to yourself? Biological brother, full sit. Delamana told his counterparts in North Carolina that they might want to check and see if Anthony Brown had any brothers. FBI policy doesn't prohibit a state from pursuing a partial match within its own borders. What he heard back the next day was not what he expected. He has 11 brothers. His 11 brothers? Six of those brothers were deceased. However, there was one brother who was in a neighboring county on a misdemeanor parole violation. The investigator's next move was right out of CSI. They offered him a cigarette. He took that cigarette and then finished the interview, and they took that cigarette back to the laboratory. Oh. Ran that very quickly, and it matched at all. 13, and then that would generate the arrest warrant. The man who actually raped and murdered Deborah Sykes was Anthony Brown's older brother, Willard. Confronted with the DNA evidence, he confessed, and Daryl Hunt, after 19 years, was finally set free. When you consider both parties, we will dismiss this case with prejudice. And I'm convinced that, but for the, obviously you see that in the tape, and that's why I talk about how important the post-familial search investigation is. Because in a situation where Daryl Hunt is in prison, basically after the DNA exonerated him, but for a good investigation and follow-up that got to Mr. Brown, uh, Daryl Hunt was released. So it takes more than the DNA to actually get to who the person is, and that's what we're finding in the research that we're doing. I saw Barry's, one of Barry's many statistics during lunch, and uh, he indicated that there is the number of people that with, after an exoneration, now have been found through the database. And you know, that number, I think, is way too low. And I think if we were to utilize familial searching, we could raise that number from 40 to 60 percent. Uh, and I've seen some papers that said we could increase hits by 40 percent if we were to use a good, sound familial search mechanism in the United States. So there was really no one other outside of California that was doing any research around using familial searching in the United States, and maybe some of you are doing that, I just don't know, but we decided that we'd start doing it in our lab to see 
if we, in fact, could find a software that helped us do this, develop a software. We validated our software against Dr. Brenner's software. We paid him to come out, run his software in our database. Our database has about 1,700 known reference samples in it. And we ran it against our forensic unknowns of 900. And by using his software initially, and then a software developed by somebody that works in my office, we were able to come up with three, and then eventually five individuals in that small database where there was a 90% chance that we had the relative in the reference database. We used YSTRs then for those males. If there was a father, son, or brother connection, we used YSTRs to see if they had the same Y chromosome and then we would continue our investigation if we got that kind of confirmation. I'm just going to show you one of the examples that we got. We were told there was a 90% chance that in an unsolved burglary where we had some earwax on an ear piece from a cell phone, uh, we got a DNA profile. We were t our software told us there was a 90% chance that this was the offspring of this individual that's pictured here. Uh, he's somebody that's very well known to us in Denver, in fact, is serving a 96-year sentence for attempted murder. Uh, we ran the YSTRs to see if they have the same paternal line. We got the same YSTR type. Then we, we uh, did the investigation that we do. We created a family tree. Of course, we weren't interested in the women. That left us three men that were the offspring of the father. We looked at, into our Department of Corrections records, and the first two had pretty good alibis. They were in prison at the time of our burglary. So that left us with the individual, the third son. Uh, he was in prison at the time we were doing the investigation. We have an all-felon statute now in Colorado since 2007. And so we called the Department of Corrections and said, uh, do you have this guy? And they said, yes. And we said, have you DNA tested him yet and put it in the database? Because if they had, we should have had a CODIS hit. And they said, no. And we said, could you move him up on the list? And they said, yes. And in two weeks, we had a CODIS hit for, to, from him to the earwax on our, on our cell phone. We had a couple of other examples, and in all of the cases that we found, we were able to show that the individual our software was saying was likely related was the individual that we were looking for. So we decided, since we have a relatively small database, that we would engage our state crime lab and uh, the CBI to see they are the keepers of our state database, which has now well over 80,000 individuals in it, and with, they would run all the forensic unknowns in their database against all their forensic knowns. And they were willing to do that under a very strict protocol that they have written, and it is still being written, and is still being edited, and I hope that uh, we finish that soon. But uh, we were able to then, out of that search, both with our database again, and again with Dr. Brenner's database, to validate those two softwares, uh, we were able to come up with 13 individuals where there's a 90% chance that they are somehow relatives. We wanted, though, to study, okay, 90% usually was pretty good standard, but how low could we go and still get that confirmation in the Ys and uh, still have a meaningful search if we did a post-search investigation? So we obtained 15 individuals, separate individuals, uh, where we had a 75% chance where they were related. We asked our crime lab, the state crime lab, to send us, without the names, a sample of the DNA they had. We ran YSTRs and compared those YSTRs where it was a male-to-male -male match. We had six male-to-male -male matches, and uh, we have confirmed with YSTRs uh, that there's still a potential that these individuals are related. We don't have access to mitochondrial testing. We would do that with the females to males, but we have not been able to do that. Many of these are unsolved rape cases and serious crimes that we're hoping that not only will we show that this software can be used, but also will help us solve those cases. 
uh, there were nine pairs where we actually had a connection with a female, either in the database or it's a female uh, crime scene sample. And our hope is that even though we don't have the mitochondrial uh, to back it up, that we will be able to get those names and do the same type of follow-up investigation to see if we can uh, solve those cases and set the parameters for a uh, familial search policy that will hopefully be utilized in the state of Colorado. But I think of two things. One is the victims. There'll be more victims if this person is not caught. And the other is the person that could be falsely accused and sitting in prison. Just weeks ago, the city of Winston-Salem offered Hunt an apology and $1.65 million to compensate him for his years in prison. From his office overlooking the old county courthouse, he now works to help other former inmates re-enter society. And he's thankful that North Carolina isn't a state where a partial DNA match can't be pursued. If it wasn't for this, then I wouldn't be here. Thank you. And Betty Lane is going to give us the final presentation in this uh, segment, and it's going to be on uh, her experience in the state of Virginia and utilizing post-conviction DNA testing. Betty Lane? Yes. By way of introduction, for those of you who do not know me, um, I am rather direct and rather blunt, um, so you might want to brace yourself as we go through this. One of the things when I was first asked to speak was to give the defense interests in post-conviction testing. And to be honest, I thought immediately I was a little offended because defense interests are the same as everybody else's interests. You know, my presentation on that could be the same as Dean's presentation. So, but I thought, well, that's kind of a weaseling out of it. I'll go ahead and try and do something. So, these are the defense interests, truth and justice. And you have to keep in mind, this is the post-conviction phase. I am not going to get my client out unless I prove he didn't do it. And as you can see from the Daryl Hunt case, usually you have to prove who did do it. Just proving your client didn't do it isn't enough. Now, maybe you're thinking, uh, truth and justice, that's kind of weaseling out to on the defense interest. So what's the real interest for the defense here? And I think it's collaboration. What the defense wants now in the post-conviction process is to be involved. We want to be at the table. We want to have a say in how things progress, the procedures that are used. And this isn't always a natural state for prosecutors or crime labs to deal with the defense. And I think that's especially true where you have states where although our criminal justice system is set up as an adversary system, there are states where it's, I, I like to call it extreme adversarial system, because it's more than just the process in terms of trial that's adversary, it's also adversarial to getting information for the defense. The defense is always fighting to get information in some places. For instance, my home state of Virginia, we do not have open file discovery. We have extremely limited rules for discovery. So the defense is always fighting through that whole process to get information, to get access. And this becomes, it becomes very difficult to switch out of that pattern, I think, for everyone when you get to a post-conviction procedure, although it is in everyone's best interest to do so. And to do that, I think you need to keep in mind several things about truth and justice. First of all is that it does not belong to just one person. The truth belongs to everyone. You're not supposed to be hiding it or destroying it. We can all agree on these things. The search for the truth involves these things. And this is very similar to Dean's presentation about these are the interests that the crime lab has in terms of finding the evidence, getting it tested. This is something that we can all agree on. So who's interested in justice? Obviously, everyone is interested in justice. 
Here, I actually wanted to quote Rodney King and say, can't we all just get along? But my law partner said that wasn't distinguished enough, so I decided to go for Calvin Coolidge to say that in, all liberty is individual. You take a correlation from that, though, all justice is collective. We all have to work for it. We're all interested in it. This is something that we do together. And for the lawyers out there, whenever you're talking about justice, how we get justice, we're talking about due process here. And for you crime lab folks, this is what we're talking about when we say that we want fairness. We want these things. We want notice, access, we want resources. When you're doing due process, though, the very first thing you have to start out with is a plan so that everybody knows where you're going. Because then if there is an objection, if someone has concerns, they can raise it. But if they don't know how you're proceeding, they won't know what to do or what to object to. And this is also something you need to keep in mind, too. If you are not telling people what you're doing, if you're keeping things hidden, the natural instinct for people to think is, well, what are you hiding? You know, there must be something there that you don't want us to know. And this is especially true for defense attorneys. Because if you're not telling us something or you're trying to keep something from us, we're immediately thinking it's something bad for you. And so we want it even more. So when you're talking about a plan with crime laboratories, what you're talking about are protocols. And in a post-conviction setting, for protocols, these are the issues that you're going to encounter. And one of the parts of my presentation is also to talk about Virginia and some of the things that we've learned there. And I don't know if you're all familiar with Virginia's old case testing project, but just to give you a really brief synopsis, this all arose uh, with a fellow by the name of Marvin Anderson. And in 2001, it was discovered after he had for years and years been asking for physical evidence in his case and having been told it had been destroyed. The laboratory director in Virginia pulled the case file from storage, which was just supposed to be documents concerning the case, mainly to answer the question of Peter Neufeld, what happened to the evidence after you had it? He opened up the case file, and in that case file, the analyst had taped the swabs, the evidentiary swabs, to her run sheet. So in fact, there was physical evidence in Marvin Anderson's case. It was tested, he was exonerated. When it was talked about in the media and advertised that this analyst, that was her thing to do. She saved the evidence, thinking one day it might be useful. So two other gentlemen who had the same analyst in their case also asked for testing. The evidence was there. They were also exonerated. At that point, our governor, Governor Mark Warner, starting to get a little concerned. That's pretty high in terms of exonerations. We were rolling through a few that year decided we needed to do kind of a random sampling of her cases, pull some, we'll find out, you know, what we're facing here. And it was 31 cases. There were two more exonerations. And importantly from those two, they were individuals that had never asked for testing. One of those individuals pled guilty. The governor at that point decided that what we needed to do was a fuller review. Take all of the cases from 1973 to 1988, which is when this examiner was there in this process, her saving of the evidence was going on, and do a full-scale review. It's called the Old Case Testing Project or the Mary Jane Burton Case Testing Project. Um, the Mary Jane Burton part's a bit of a misnomer because that was the analyst that was initially thought to be the only one doing that. Turns out she wasn't because she had trained other analysts to do the same thing. So there are a lot of cases to go through. This was announced in December of 2005 in a press release from our governor. And it was a page and a half long. And this is pretty much everything we knew about the project in terms of protocols, how it was going to proceed. It was called a full-scale review. They were going to start with cases where there was a convicted defendant and it was to be done on a rolling basis, meaning as they found the cases, send them off for testing, the outside lab was going to be used so that we could do this quickly. You know, there wouldn't be years and years that people would have to wait for the results. 
It was going to take one and a half to two years and cost $1.4 million. That, as far as the public and the defense bar knew, were the protocols involved in this. That is how our project was described. This, for selection under protocols, you know, you always have these issues of how you're going to select your cases. In Virginia, it was supposed to be, as we understood it, full-scale review meant all cases. Other instances, you're going to have defense requests, prosecution requests, court order. And you have screening method there, who should screen. Uh, it was a little unclear as to whether there would be any screening in the Virginia cases because it was supposed to be all. So we didn't think that there would be any screening other than someone, laboratory personnel, opening the file and seeing that there was physical evidence. What we have found, though, is that all doesn't mean all as this evolved. In fact, there were changing criteria. At first, it was stated that the convictions had to be certain convictions. So it wasn't all convicted defendants. And the definition of a qualifying conviction was evolving. Initially, it was mentioned that it was listed in a letter from the governor who said these three convictions, and they could remember rape was one, murder, they weren't really sure what the third was. Um, but eventually, it came out that the qualifying convictions were crimes against the person. And this is a difficulty in, I don't know whether this applies to a lot of other states, but in Virginia, crimes against the person don't necessarily involve breaking and entering with intent to defile. And you can see how in a rape case, part of a plea bargain might have been to a lesser charge or to the other charge of breaking and entering with intent to defile. That carries up to life. Serious offense, someone could be in prison, but they wouldn't be tested under this project because it wasn't, quote, a crime against the person. The other difficulty that we've had is on getting accurate information. These are supposed to be convicted defendant cases. And you can imagine the difficulty of laboratory personnel trying to determine whether or not someone was convicted of a specific offense. And I think here is where collaboration would have been extremely beneficial because lawyers know how to go to courts, find the record, and find out if there was a conviction, what the conviction was for. Because I'm sure you all understand that you know, criminal records that you get printed out from the state police or various organizations like that aren't always accurate. There is omitted information. Some is inaccurate. When people get arrested, they may give a different name. Then you get records cross-referenced based on everybody using the same name. Also, sending letters to courthouses doesn't necessarily mean a clerk is going to respond to the letter or have the time to go to the basement to find the case file to find out if someone is convicted. So there's been a lot of um, difficulty in getting accurate information there that has delayed the project significantly. And I think that here, collaboration, defense attorneys, prosecutors would have really been beneficial. One other wrinkle that we've had is that in Virginia, in our testing statute, any convicted felon can go to the court and ask for testing. When the project was announced, and it was announced as a full-scale review, a lot of defense attorneys and defendants thought, okay, if my case, they have evidence, it'll get tested. Okay, that's not a sign of anything, I promise you. <laughs> um, okay, this is interesting. You're just kind of all out there. Um, the, the defense didn't worry necessarily about trying to find out if their particular case was had evidence in it because they trusted that all the cases would be tested. And when it was discovered that there were qualifying convictions, not all cases were being tested, it did become an issue because defendants need to know that there is evidence there so that they have a right to go to the court and ask about it. Because for years, defendants were told, just like Marvin Anderson was told for years, there is no physical evidence. You know, he had even been told by the lab that there was no physical evidence there several times, when in fact there was. So it, it, it became a concern of our legislature and groups to try and notify defendants so that they, if their case is not being tested, could go to court and get the testing if they wanted to assert their innocence. 
second part of our protocols are where you're talking about technology. And by default here, I mean what you're already doing in your laboratory. And it may be that defense believes that additional testing or different testing would give a more probative result, and they want to be able to obtain that testing. Prosecution may think the same thing, and they may want to use different technology. You also need in your protocols to decide who's going to decide this, you know, who's going to be the decider. And if there is a decider, is there going to be someone that you can appeal to beyond that so that all of your concerns can be heard? In Virginia, we're using an outside contractor, um, and that has raised some concerns about maybe they're using different protocols than the regular protocols that are used for casework in Virginia, and in fact they are. Um, they have set up a system in Virginia to where the outside contracting laboratory does the analysis sends the result to the Virginia laboratory, the state laboratory, that then interprets the results and has the obligation to issue the report. And I think that may raise some concerns. We're not sure yet, and you'll see why, because where we are in the process. Uh, initially, there were concerns about consumption, and I think those concerns have been addressed because it appears, at least from the review of one set of bench notes from the outside laboratory, that they're making a very concerted effort not to use all of the sample and not to consume. Reporting, your next step in the protocols. Who gets the results and when? And these are all people that conceivably could want the results. And I put the public on here because you need to keep the public in mind in any criminal justice system action. You need to keep it in mind when you're using state funding. They do have an interest. In Virginia, there was initially no plan for issuing reports of any kind. Uh, the reports were initially, the results were just given to the governor in a form of a letter, very summarized, this many people included, this many people excluded. Um, but since then, things have changed and there are new, issue, new plans for creating the reports. Distributing the reports, that seems to be a bit of an evolving standard as well. Clearly, it's going to go to law enforcement. Um, we've raised issues about, gee, the defense would like to have a copy too, um, and maybe it shouldn't just be on the prosecutors to give it to the defense, because we are talking about cases from 30 years ago. Usually your prosecutors are not the same prosecutors that were involved in the case. They may know nothing about it, and they may not be able to determine what the results mean in terms of whether or not they're probative or not. And I think that the defense very much has an interest in receiving the report. And it looks like now it's kind of a, a, a hodgepodge of, well, we'll give it to the defense if they ask. And this comes back to the notice problem. If the defendants don't know that their case is being tested, they don't know to ask. Um, even if they do know that their case is being tested, nobody's told them that they have to ask to get the results. So that's a concern. On the investigation, once you get the results, what do they mean? And that is a large subject of debate. You can have a case where the prosecution will say that the DNA results are absolutely meaningless. It could have been a boyfriend who contributed it. It could have been, if the victim was someone in the, the trade, that it could have just been another customer, that sort of situation. But you really need to determine ahead of time, once the results are provided, are you going to do anything further in terms of the investigation? And this is where Mitch's idea of familial searches is very important, I think, to the defense as well. If we have a case where the DNA comes back and it's not the defendant and the prosecution says that's not enough to exclude your guy, then I need to prove who it is so that I can say that the DNA is probative. It wasn't another boyfriend. It wasn't just another customer. It was, in fact, the person who actually committed the crime. And so whether or not defendants are going to have access to a database to run a search, whether or not they're going to have access to do a familial search. And if the prosecution is going to do it, fine. If the prosecution is not going to do it and refuses to do it, will the defense have a right all on their own? We're not there yet in Virginia. Um, the re we simply don't have any of the results yet. Uh, out of the 700 to 800 cases that are being tested, 41 cases have a written report that has gone to law enforcement only. There are plans, apparently, to give it to the defense, but no defense has them yet. So we are not to this stage, and we would have an opportunity to design a plan. And I'm hoping that a collaborative effort here would produce a very good plan. 
Next step in your protocols is who pays, and this is always a question for people. Um, in Virginia, it really hasn't been so much of a, a, an issue at the beginning of the testing because the governor had ordered it. The state is paying for it. The state had allocated $1.4 million, but we ran out of money. We've blown through our state money of $1.4 million, and now we have the NIJ grant of $4.5 to do the rest of the cases. I have some question marks here because I'm not really sure exactly what the state money paid for beyond the testing. Um, we know that at least 300 cases were tested, but I don't know if that was allocated towards getting the reports out, which I doubt since none of the reports have come out. And I think that you need to definitely keep in mind that for future projects, for other states, having accounting and being able to, you know, give other people information about your testing project and how much it costs helps other states plan. And Virginia is such a large project that it should be good information for other states in thinking, okay, over the course of five years, we might have 300 cases. How much money are we going to need to set aside? The last part of your protocols, you need to know when you're going to start it, when it's going to be completed, and any causes, of your delay, causes for delay should be explained. This is where things get really interesting in Virginia because you know, this was announced in December of 2005, one to two year project, rolling process, supposed to get reports out quickly, defendants would know the results. And the, this next part has actually been updated as of January, a few days ago. Uh, 41 reports have been issued. They have been sent to law enforcement, but not to the defense yet. So we're certainly not doing the type of project that was initially announced. And there's not a problem with changing as you go along, but it would be a really good idea to explain why you're changing and get others involved in the process so that as a collaborative effort you can have a good plan to go forward, to know how your testing project is going to go, and everyone will understand and there won't be a, as much paranoia about how things are proceeding. Keeping in mind, as I said, the defense interests are just like everybody else's. We just want the truth so that we can get justice for our client. And we want to be a part of the process because we really can help you. You know, as er adversarial as everything is, it doesn't have to be. Just because that is an old pattern doesn't necessarily mean that it's the best way to proceed. And the surest way to keep a defense attorney from nagging at you and coming at you is to get them on your side and to get them involved in the process, to have some input into how the procedures are written, and we might actually be able to help you in terms of collecting information you might need for your project, information about your case. When you get to the stage where you have the results and you need to decide whether or not they're probative, the defense can help you with getting access to transcripts, for getting additional information, and should be very involved. In the Virginia process, if defense attorneys and had been involved, we might have been able to get conviction information, reliable conviction information, quicker and might have had a better result in terms of completing the project on time. And that's all.